welcome to Mass Memorial CME Church. We're so glad to have you here today on our Missionary Emphasis Sunday. We are located at 5601 South Waverly Road in Lansing, Michigan, where our pastor is the Reverend Adrian Swanigan, and our First Lady is Sister Janine Swanigan. We are so happy that you chose this Sunday to be a part of our worship service. So let's go to church. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple, that all the earth be silent before him. Let's join together in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body. And Let us pray. Dear God, fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit this day. Fill us with your joy, your wisdom, 
and with constant reminders that your presence will go with us and will give us rest. Thank you that you came to give new life, peace, hope, and joy to your children. Thank you that your power is made perfect in our weakness. We know that you are with us and you fight for your people. We believe that it is not by might nor by power, but by your spirit that you make a difference in our world. We choose to trust you today and recognize the authority of who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. This morning we'll be reading from Ephesians. I'll be reading from Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, a prayer for the Ephesian. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp what wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that suppresses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, from the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 
Saints, once again, welcome. We're just glad to have you here today on our Missionary Emphasis Sunday. And our theme today is Renewing Our Faith. Our scripture is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. You know, it's just that time of year where we all need to, um, I know many people make resolutions, but um, I think in, the, in, the, in our Christian walk, you know, we do need to renew our faith because... Um, from year to year as we go through things, it's just time for us to re-energize and get going again. So bringing the message today um, will be Dr. Linda Logan. And Dr. Logan is special to the Mass Memorial CME Church because she is one of our local pastors. And uh, she also um, currently presides over our evangelism and outreach ministry along with the new members class. Uh, she also serves as a member of the Board of Christian Education She's a part of the local missionary society, and she's president of the Michigan, Indiana Region Missionary Society. Uh, Dr. Logan accepted Christ at a ver very young age of 12, and she's been actively involved in the Christian church ever since that fateful day. Dr. Logan is the vice president and chief diversity officer of Olivet College. She served as the vice president and dean of student life for 14 years. Uh, she has worked at the college for over 22 years now. She has also served as the chair of the social science department and the director of the criminal justice department. She's held positions as a researcher at Michigan State University, uh, as a substance abuse and mental health counselor for over 20 years. She also holds a PhD from Michigan State University in human development. Dr. Logan has a master's degree in counseling from Central Michigan State University and a bachelor's degree in sociology and psychology from Saginaw Valley State University. She's a strong believer in community service. Dr. Logan is the president of the Capital Area Zanta International Club, past president of the Lansing Women's uh, Club Association, and sits on various boards on the local and state levels. She is a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She is a widow. She has two, two adult children, um, Carter and her daughter Latasha, and seven grandchildren. She is the fifth of eight children in her family. Uh, we would like to present to some and introduce to others after the next selection, Dr. Linda Logan. Thank you.
praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. Yes, yes, yes. The Lord is preparing us for great things. We have yet to see. As we increase our faith, God will move us forward and open the doors to those great things. Thank you, missionaries. President Plummer, Reverend Swanigan, First Lady, church family for the opportunity to share a message on Missionary Emphasis Sunday. God bless you all. The theme today is renewing our faith. The scripture is Ephesians 3, <clears throat> 14 through 19. And it's all about prayer and Paul's prayers for the Ephesians. And he's praying for the church with those faithful members and those faithful Ephesian believers. For this reason, the scripture reads, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Aren't those beautiful words coming from Paul? Aren't those beautiful, encouraging words coming from Paul? Insightful prayer coming from Paul as he prays for the church of Ephesians. My message today in part is inspired by a message that I, that I, that I read by Delilah Bell and Bruce Rosato. And they had done um, some commentaries on Paul and I thought them interesting. So I decided to incorporate some of it in part in my message today. We will take a look at why Paul prayed, who he was praying to and the confidence in his prayer and what he prayed. And for many scholars, they call it the fourfold pray, the four part pray. And so, for us, we're just going to say Paul was praying <laughs> and he did a serious prayer. And just that little message. Can you imagine that these verses are just from 14 through 19? And these are very short uh, 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 verses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And when I look at them, it's seven sentences, maybe eight, depending on your font. And it was a powerful prayer. And this prayer has resonated throughout the years as people are praying, they reference this prayer over and over again in, in terms of praying for the church. And sometimes we get in church and we pray for 30, 40 minutes. Some people like to pray a long time. Uh, but the, the essence is, is one of the things I notice in the Bible when I look at prayers, they're short and to the point and concise and it, had, and it packs powerful messages. And Paul has packed a powerful message into this prayer. For the Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 19. <clears throat> so let's just go to our first part and just look at why Paul prayed. That would be in verse 14. As missionaries, we are often called upon to pray for others. And hearing, and oftentimes we listen to prayers of other people and hearing their prayer requests or hearing others pray they make known to us or we get to know all of their anxieties, all their stressors, things that depress them, their fears, their hopes, their illnesses, their dreams, all through the content of prayer. And we also get to know at times how urgent these prayers are or how important they are based on a person's level of intensity. That is not always the case based on intensity because someone could become as a cucumber given a prayer and, and their heart very intense. But sometimes we see that outward expression of intensity, what gives us a clue or an indication of just how important that prayer is to this person. 
And we also pray oftentimes when we pray. So as missionaries, that's a huge responsibility for us because they are entrusting us. When people ask us to pray for them or we pray with them, they are entrusting us with the nuggets of the heart, the things that they hold near and dear to their hearts, and they're entrusting us with that. So with that comes a great deal of responsibility. And when we say that we will pray for people or pray with people, it is, our, it is up to us to do exactly as we say, just as Paul did, just as Paul was praying for the Ephesians throughout that chapter. He could, that book, he, con, he continued to pray for them and to hold them up. And as missionaries, it is our responsibility. Sometimes people might ask us to pray and we'll say, oh, I'll pray for you. And then we don't get around to praying for that person. And it's our responsibility to come back and ask for forgiveness, forgiveness from God for just not being truthful or um, reliable in that instance. And that we hold up our bargain and begin to pray for those individuals. And sometimes we just pray for things. Uh, we pray for material things. We pray for houses and money and family and jobs and vacations. We pray for things that are outside of us, but not, and not always praying for things that are inside of us. Paul's prayer to the um, Ephesians was all about what was inside of us, not outside of us. He didn't pray for a physical church building. He didn't pray for the church mortgage to be paid off. He didn't pray to have the funds to fix this or to do that. He prayed for our, and he prayed for what was in our hearts. He prayed for what was in our spirit. He prayed internally for us to connect with God. For Paul, it was all about how we are going to connect with God. And as believers and in the church, just like the Ephesians of at, at that time, today he's asking us to stay in touch with God and, that in, and to have that internal relationship with God, that heartfelt, committed relationship with God internally. After explaining to the believers in uh, the Ephesian believers all about that incredible life with God that he has given them by his grace, and through faith in Jesus Christ, which he did in the first chapter of Ephesians through the third chapter, Apostle Paul humbly got down on his knees. Now, just as we see that verse, for, that first verse, when it says Paul got down on his knees, Paul positioned himself in a very humble position as he was uh, uh, writing a prayer to the Ephesians. He, he, he humbled himself before God. He was humbling himself because he wanted these prayers to be, he wanted his, his prayer to be received. And so he humbled himself before God and, and really praying that God would receive his prayer and renew our faith in God through his son, Jesus Christ. So that doesn't mean every time we pray, we have to get down on our knees, but that just shows the sincerity of Paul and his and positioning himself and in, in terms of holding God up and honoring him and worshiping him and accepting him and, and giving that prayer so that it might be received. Ephesians um, 3 chapter 3, 14 to 19 is a prayer of Paul for all people, not just for the Jews, but also the Gentiles alike, to know God and experience a relationship with God to, and knowing our purpose in God and knowing our identity in God and to experience an intimacy with God like no other. We all have, have had in our life intimate relationships in terms of our friendships, our parents, our other loved ones, marriages, and other friends. We, we, so we know what an intimate relationship is. But Ephesians is asking us to have a, that same intimate relationship with God, just as we've had 
uh, have been uh, influenced to have relationships with others, we're asking, uh, uh, Paul is asking us to have that intimate relationship with God. It is through that intimate relationship that we are renewed by God's grace. Our faith is renewed. Our overall well-being is renewed just by that intimate relationship with God. We can only imagine how excited the church was, must have been to know Paul was writing them and praying for them. Praying for someone can bring a great deal of comfort to them. And, and, and with the type of prayer that Paul put forward, it also was very instructive prayer. And, and a prayer that was designed to empower the church and to strengthen them. And so I can only imagine, and we can only imagine how excited they were that he was actually praying for them. How excited are you when someone says they're going to pray for you? Do we take it for granted and just say, yeah, right, you'll, you'll pray for me? Or do we rejoice in knowing that there are others petitioning God on our behalf and lifting us up before God? Isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't that a beautiful gift to be able to pray for someone just as Paul prayed for the church of believers? It's beautiful for someone to pray for us and to lift us up before God. It wasn't enough that these Gentile believers knew the theological truth of their welcome to God through the gospel they also needed to be empowered to live it. It's one thing to know the word of God, but it's another thing to live it. And that at times takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of power. It takes a lot of support to be able to live the word of God. Paul was thrilled to proclaim it to them. And he also shows that he is eager to pray with them and to enable them because it is through his prayers that they are enabled. That is his prayer to God, that he will enable them, he will empower them. God will lift them up to continue to grow the church. To whom Paul prayed? We know that Paul was praying and he declared that his prayer was a very serious one because he bowed down on his knee when he prayed. Perhaps you and I might pray sitting in a chair or sometimes we might pray standing, but when we're serious, like when we're at church, we go to the altar and those who are able to physically bow down, we kneel down on our knees and pray. And uh, it's not always necessary to do that, but the sincerity is in the heart. And so the seriousness of a prayer really comes from your sincerity from your heart and your and your belief that you put into that prayer that God is going to hear you and answer that prayer. Of course, we all know this is this is conditional, conditional based upon being uh, accepting Christ as your personal savior. And when you do that, then the windows of heaven opens up for you. And so as and we know that Paul had accepted um had accepted this and that Paul said he did for okay he said that because of God's grace to the Gentiles I bow to my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named he is proclaiming God he is pro he is proclaiming Lord Jesus Christ and he, and he put it right out there. The whole family in heaven and earth is named. And it is through Jesus Christ that God hears our prayers. So if we want our prayers heard, then we must, we must accept Christ as our personal savior. And that means we must have faith in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful message for the missionaries to share as they do service in their communities? In the first great prayer, he said, he prayed to God, our Lord, Jesus Christ. So who did he pray for? Who did he pray to? He prayed to Jesus Christ. That, the father of glory. That seems like a very formal and objective name. He not only said God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the father of glory. That's a very formal name. 
And, um, but in the prayer before us, here he prays for uh, in, enablement in the prayer that we're looking at now and uh, Ephesians 14 through 19, he is praying for an uh, enablement. So when he says this, he says to the father, to the father, he didn't make, he didn't say to, uh, in, in uh, chapter one, verse 14, he said, the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory. But in chapter three, 14, to 14 through 19, he prayed to the father. And so he uses a more familiar name. Jesus purchased us for us the right to call him father. Notice that his fatherhood is great. It includes the whole family in heaven. This may include all the saints, all the angels, all rejoicing in heavenly glory. And it is the whole family of Christ, as well as those of us on earth, which includes all of those who believe in him for salvation, according to his promise. God's fatherhood is great, and he is a great father. There is no other father greater than God, none other. And Paul is aware of this. And he wants to make sure that the church understands that God is a great father, the best father they will ever have. And it is through, and, and, and it is important that they understand that God is his father and that they stay empowered. And Paul prays with great confidence. He doesn't stutter, like I might be stuttering through this sermon a little bit, but he doesn't stutter in his word. Paul was pretty clear and pretty firm when he, um, when, when, when he was writing that letter and praying. His prayer is that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. And that's very much worth thinking about. To be empowered to live out what Jesus Christ has done for us is marvelous. It's not something that we ourselves have the power to do, but it is not a prayer that Paul prays on the basis of our abilities and resources. There are many things that we cannot do under our own abilities and under our own resources. And Paul prays for the church because he knows that they must have a supernatural empowerment to do these marvelous things that God has in store for them and to just to live out what Jesus Christ has done for us and has in store for us. Because we know that God has an unlimited resource. Our father has, our great father has an unlimited resource. And note that he says, according to God's riches, it is not merely out of his riches, which of course would be abundant, but rather it's according to as great as God's riches are, that's how sufficient he is to empower us in the ways that Paul prays, according to his riches, according to God's will, according to God's will in our life. For what Paul prayed? First, notice that Paul's pray, prayed for strength. That was like the very first thing he prayed for, not strength to lift weights and heavy boxes, he was praying for spiritual strength and inner strength. He asked us for, ask us to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. God's glory is shown in our weakness. When God is weak, he is strong. That's what gives us the testimonies we have about how God, how good God has been for us, where he himself proves to be our strength. There is we have evidence of it through this strength in the inner man. Uh, the, this strength in the inner man is through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's not for our show of power. When we talk about that inner strength, when Paul is talking about that inner strength, he's not trying to physically show how strong he is like Solomon and knocking down all the pillars within a building. That's not the strength he's talking about. He's talking about our inner strength, that inner power that God has given us. And it's not for outward show, it's, it's to empower us. It is for inwardly for us to be able to endure the trials that we have to go through to strengthen us internally. 
And when people see that you come, that you walk through a fire and the ashes and you're still here, it is a testimony of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul prays for confidence in Christ's indwelling. He wants us to be confident in knowing that Christ is inside of us, dwells with us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. Christ dwells, dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that dwells in us keeps us in a relationship with our Father. It is through our relationship, the spiritual relationship that he, we have inside of us that keeps us connected. He asks that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. It is through faith that, our, that the indwelling takes place. It is through faith that God dwells within us. Through our relationship with God, we have a constant flow of strength and power each day. We are renewed each day. As Christ followers, we can uh, confidently rejoice and trust in his constant presence with us and in us and allowing him full reign over our lives in every circumstance. Through our relationship with God and the faith that we have in him and that he has much plan for us according to his will. Missionaries, let us constantly stay steadfast in renewing our faith and rejoicing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful thing? When we are down, we can just spend time with the spirit of the Holy Ghost, with the spirit and indwelling in us and renewing our faith. In John 14, 23, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Aren't those beautiful words that if you, if, if you love Jesus and, and, and keep Jesus's word, then Jesus's father will love you as well. And we will come to him and make our home with him. And God and Jesus will make a home with us in dwelling within our spirit. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Paul prays for an apprehension um, of divine love. Not just that it would be experienced, but that it would be fully understood and believed. Because you can experience something, but then you still might not understand what was happening nor believe it. He prayed that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints that is the width, that is the length, that is the depth, that is the height of God's love. So God wants you to be deeply rooted, but at the same time, he wants you to understand that are, as you are deeply rooted and grounded, that you understand the width and the depth, the length and the height of God's love. It is so deep. And it is important that the people of the church have that understanding and knowledge to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, knowledge that none of us have or understand, knowledge that supersedes anything we want to, we, we can think or imagine. We know that this verse is used in other places, a verse similar to this is used in other per places, but it reinforces that God's grace can um, pass any kind of knowledge that you might have. So when we talk about fully understanding and believing, it is believing by faith because some of the things that we experience cannot be explained by our own knowledge. It, so it just supersedes any of our knowledge. Only by God's grace can we grasp the full dimensions of Jesus' love for us. Can you imagine how deep those dimensions are when we talk about God's love? Because when we talk about, um, when we talk about relationships, and we talk about building relationships and we look at people, at, at the average person, our children, our loved ones, uh, people that we, friends that we might have relationships with. They can only be on so, so many dimensions, but there is no dimension that exists 
that Jesus' love is not there for us. It can't, no matter how wide it is, no matter how what length it is, no matter how deep it is, no matter how high it is, God's love is encompassing it all. And, is root, and it allows us to be rooted and grounded in love. We cannot always be rooted and grounded in, in love with individuals. Some, some of us have been married before and we made those proclamations that we would be married forever. And that didn't last. That didn't last. Because that's man to man making a commitment. And, 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 not, and not being rooted and grounded in God's love. Rooted and grounded through in love of Christ. It's a beautiful thing to know that you don't need anybody else to love Christ. You, oh, you have the, oh, you love Christ for yourself. You, you can't do it for your children. You can't do it for your spouse. You can't do it for your friend and they can't do it for you. You, you have the ability to be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. And no one can take that away from you. And we saw that a lot when in the early days during the Christian times, when uh, when when the when the church was being developed, and they were uh, they were killing people who acknowledged that they were Christians, and that still happens today in certain parts of the world. If people stand up and say that they are Christians, they stand the risk of being murdered. And but that when they stand up and do that. They mean that they're rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. I remember that there was a, a high school shooting um, out west. I can't remember what, what state it was in. And the killer wanted to know, looked at this girl and wanted to know if she was a Christian. And she said, yes, she was a Christian. And he shot her dead. But she, this young woman, this young girl, a high school student, was rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. Can you imagine how... The, um, how they all rejoice when God brought her home to him for someone uh, so young to be able to say, yes, they are Christians. Yes, I'm rooted and grounded in the love of God. <clears throat> yes, I have faith in God. Yes, God dwells within me to the point that she's looking down the barrel of a gun and able to say that. How many of you would be able to say that? How many of us would be able to say it? None, we believe we would, most of us, but none of us really know if that is something that we would be able to do unless we were placed in that position. May we never, ever have to know. And finally, Paul prays that we might be given an experience of divine fullness, divine fullness. The more we know God and his love for us, the more we love him. We can never outlove God. Isn't that something? We can never outlove God. We can't love God more than he loves us. We can't outlove him. But, and, and it is through that love, we experience that divine fullness. The love of God <clears throat> fills our hearts. The love of God is an experience that is so, so divine that it takes away our lack and our cares. It places us through our faith in a position to know that God is in control and he is taking care of the situation. And when we focus on that indwelling of the Holy Spirit and our communications with Jesus Christ, through our spiritual communication with Jesus Christ, it just leads us to experience that divine fullness we talk about being full when we eat some food and we get full from eating food or drinking a beverage. That's not the kind of fullness I'm talking about. What Paul is talking about is that spiritual fullness, that overwhelming fullness, that kind of fullness that bubbles up before you and just makes you want to shout, make you want to dance like David, make you want to cry and weep because you are so happy that you are at one with the Holy Spirit and your heart is filled. And at that moment, you're filled with confidence. You're filled with love. You're filled with empowerment. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't that beautiful? The more we know God and his love for us, 
the more we love him. And we can never, ever, ever out love God. You know, some people will love us to a point and then they'll walk away. But God's not like that. We humble ourselves before him and follow his doctrines. He's going to love us. And then we have this thing called grace and mercy. Even when we are not able to live up to those things, God's grace and mercy is with us. And it is through that grace and mercy that you cannot outlove God. You cannot outlove God. As missionaries, when we choose to love people with God's love, then we will be able to understand their needs and to be able to meet them at their need. That's God's love. That's showing God's love to others. Missionaries, continue to pray and renew your strength. We live in a world hurting, a hurting world, a divided world. As missionaries, we are God's representatives walking by faith, humbling ourselves like Paul before God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Humbling ourselves like Paul. Humbling ourselves like Paul. Humbling ourselves like Paul. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We can change the lives of people that we serve. As we are serving others with God's love and the power of our faith, Others will see the God in us. We are a testimony of God's goodness. When we endure trials and tribulations, it's a testimony of the fullness of God, what the fullness of the Holy Spirit within us. In closing, let us pray for all the missionaries, church family, and friends. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we are endowed with your inner strength and power and may Christ dwell in our hearts forever. Through faith in you, we are rooted and established in your love and that we may know how wide, how deep, how high is the love of Christ. The Christ's love that supersedes all knowledge. I pray this prayer for all of our missionaries. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to you all, and thank you for allowing me to share the message today. I apologize for being a little choppy um, because I was... Um, I got lost in my reading of my, my, my sermon, so I apologize for that, but I thank you for the opportunity to worship with you today and to put God first in our lives today. It is always an honor and a privilege to say that I am a missionary of Mass Memorial CME Church and working with a group of women that do great things and will continue to do great things through Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Blessings to you. Well, church, we certainly had a high time today with the messenger, and we hope that you appreciate the time you spent with us on Missionary Emphasis Sunday. This is the invitation to discipleship. Now, if you don't know Jesus and you would like to be saved today, repeat after me this prayer. Lord, I confess I am a sinner. Forgive me for all my past sins and transgressions against you. Create in me a new heart and abide your spirit within me. Thank you, Jesus. The next step is to leave your contact information in the chat box below, or you can go to your nearest local church and tell somebody that you are a new believer in Christ. They'll know what to do. God bless you.
and now the benediction. And now unto him who was able to keep us from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. And all God's children says, Amen. Thank you.